Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome to Capes on the Couch for Come and Get Counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko. And I'm Dr. Issues. This is issue number 121, and it's a theme episode that's picked by Matt. He loves his themes, and he has given us a doozy here. Comic book death. I know what you're saying. Didn't we get deep and heavy the last two episodes with John Walker and Isaiah Bradley? Believe it or not, this one's going to be kind of a freewheeling, a fun discussion. Because the key to this discussion is the idea that death is not actually permanent for comic book characters. So with that being established, it sort of takes some of the gravitas out of it, I think, anyway. Oh, to, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, versus like a fantasy type story, you know, something like Game of Thrones where death is meaningful and the characters don't have plot armor and that anyone could die at any moment in comics it's anyone could die at any moment but they're not really going to stay dead uh, so let's jump right in then comic book death uh here's a fun little trivia fact for you the first superhero to die in comics was the comet in pop comics number 17 july 1941 this is a little history lesson for you, created by Jack Cole for MLJ Comics, the precursor to Archie Comics. Uh, John Dickering was a scientist who injected himself with a gas that allowed him to fly at the expense of uncontrollable rays that shot from his eyes. So really weird power set, but this is the 40s. Uh, so he was killed by the henchman of a gangster that he helped incarcerate. And so he was the first comic book character to die in a book. And then over the years, over the decades that ensued, death was used sparingly and had a lot of impact. Bucky is a very famous example. Jean Grey, the first time. Jason Todd. Uncle Ben, obviously, is another one. This leading to the expression that no one in comics stays dead except for Uncle Ben, Bucky, and Jason Todd. Which Oops. was true for a very long time. And then I would argue that the turning point was 1993, the death and return of Superman. Max Landis, son of John Landis, uh, the director. Max has done a lot of writing and directing in his own right. I'm not going to get into some of the personal issues about Max because he's a sketchy individual as far as I've read, but he has a stellar video on YouTube. You can check it out. It's on the death and return of Superman. And he calls together some famous friends of his to help act things out. Mandy Moore plays Lois Lane. Elijah Wood is a Hank Henshaw. It's a hilarious video in which he recaps the story with some artistic license for humor purposes. But one of the important things that he says towards the end of the video, is that the death and return of Superman didn't just kill Superman, it killed the idea of death. Because as I'm sure we're all aware, those comics sold like gangbusters. DC made a lot of money off of the death and return of Superman. And so rather than looking at it from a storytelling standpoint and saying, this was a story in which Superman was always intended to return. It wasn't done necessarily as a cheap ploy, but it was done to sort of shake things up. And we had the story that we wanted to tell. They looked at the sales and they got dollar signs in their eyes. And so then it became, well, who else can we kill and have them come back a short time later so that we can sell the books, we can sell the death, and then we can sell the return of said character. And so at the end of that, that video, the Max Landis video, he lists dozens of characters 
that have died and been resurrected since the death and return of Superman. And it really makes you wonder, you know, from a storytelling standpoint and from a writing standpoint, what happened that these writers are just willing to sort of disregard all of this, uh, disregard the permanence of death and and cheapen it for storytelling. Hmm. Okay, so just to jump in a little bit, I am not a writer by trade, so I can't speak for every writer that's ever existed, and I'm not going to. But what I will say is that by the nature of comics themselves, you're only going to get a certain amount of run. And you have to tell the story you want to tell in whatever time period you're allotted. So if a character dies off, you can't just do that carte blanche. You have to make sure that your bosses are on board with it. A character like Superman could have gone over as the killing the goose that laid the golden egg. And nobody wants that, but they, as you said, saw the dollar signs behind the idea of bringing back a character. I'm not going to try and speak for whether or not they wanted to do it as quickly as they did, or if it was just purely by popular demand. But I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit on what you're saying, 1993 for comics being the most critical time period for that, because I think literature showed that at least a century ago, Sherlock Holmes is one of the most famous characters ever. And yet, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle made it very clear when he killed him as he and Moriarty go off a cliff, that was it. And it was purely fan speculation and outright request that he continued writing that character that magically survived something that we knew humans couldn't survive and made it sound like, yeah, well, hey, he's a super smart guy. I'm sure he figured something out. I I think the groundwork has been set long before this, and we'll get into it later, but I also think that there's a dynamic that's been shown when people know something is serial, they're going to expect a story to continue. They don't ever want it to end if they're really enjoying it. So even when something has what, according to that writer, may have a natural conclusion, that doesn't mean everyone's going to just say no or just walk away. And comics really lends itself to that by the nature of its business. So, yes, it's a cash grab, but I also think it's a public demand response. There's going to come a time where if you just say to everyone, hey, whatever we do is absolutely permanent, and we see this in movies too, then you are at some point going to run out or you're going to have to create something completely new from scratch and using the trope Hollywood is out of ideas. Many people are loath to do that when they know that they can build on something that's already established a framework. Very poignantly said, and I do actually recall the Arthur Conan Doyle and the Sherlock story on sort of a metafictional level. Then you have the story of misery, Stephen King, in which the writer kills off the character only to be trapped by a super fan who says, you need to write a novel, a new story and bring her back or I'll break your legs. (sighs) Hell of a movie. I'll never look at Kathy Bates the same way again. But Matt's point is the in-universe acknowledgement that both Marvel and DC have introduced that death is not permanent and how this is beginning to impact the characters. And Matt, being Matt, came up with a list of six instances in comics where characters had, I don't want to say fully nonchalant response to death, but it was not taken with the gravitas and the meaning that we humans have in the real world where death is clearly permanent. You know, I'm reminded of the Richard Pryor bit, you know, the ultimate test is, can you survive death? So far, don't nobody we know has passed. 
the ultimate tests. Least of all, this one laying right here. It's a great bit. Uh, I think it's called Eulogy. It's one of my favorite Richard Pryor bits of all time. So before we get into the the exhibits, let's break this down then and sort of the the way that Doc and I have figured out how we're going to describe this is through the five stages of grief. At least initially, this is how we're going to discuss this this issue with some of Matt's examples as proof. So the first stage of grief is denial. And exhibit A in Matt's list is X Factor. Now, it's funny that we're talking about this because if you're a patron, we just did a trade paperback review of X Factor, the Peter David run, in which this very topic was was brought up. And it's Siren refusing to acknowledge that her father, Banshee, was killed in a plane explosion. She laughs it off at first because he's an old MI5 agent and he's had to fake his death a couple of times before. When the rest of the team offers their condolences, she asks who's up for Chinese food. She's going to get a notice in a couple of days that he's just fine and he's in hiding for black ops reasons. When Cyclops delivers Banshee's video will and she has to face the possibility that it's the real deal, she switches her coping mechanism to okay, but he's an X-Man and X-Men are always dying and coming back to life. So he's only dead for now. He's not really dead. He'll be back. And this goes on and on for years and years. And then he's resurrected as one of Apocalypse's horsemen. So that is a very clear cut example of denial of just the idea that, yeah, they're dead now, but they're not going to stay, especially in the mutant community, which the current run of X-Men as sort of rebooted by Jonathan Hickman in the House of X and Powers of Ten story is due to what the mutants have set up on Krakoa. All mutants are now functionally immortal. So it's this entire, this entire race has now become, death is meaningless to them because they'll just get resurrected. Like it was like Jonathan Hickman saw all of the mutants who had died and been resurrected over the years and said, and now everybody gets this. <laughs> And I, I think in a way, so getting back to the, the denial then, Siren is a clear example of the denial, but that's not healthy for either the characters themselves or real people, the denial of grief, well, even whether death is permanent or not. Right. I'll say that when it comes to these stages, denial can have its own phases because there's a difference between not accepting something that is considered a part of our shared reality versus not having enough information to come to the same conclusion that everyone else has. If you've ever been experienced with someone saying, as an attorney probably have, hapeus corpus, you don't have the body, then you don't assume they're dead. So... There is some truth to that. If someone goes missing, then we have legal ramifications that indicate when we say someone's dead. And, and you can go back to our Capes in Court episode to discuss that in detail. But once we have the information, let's get past that point. Once we have the information and everything points to the idea that this person is now dead, they have ceased to be. Then the question becomes... What do you do with what's supposed to be an emotional response past that? Denial is not just a denial of the information. Denial is the distancing from any feeling whatsoever that will be uncomfortable. And from that standpoint, it could be a defense mechanism to say, I'm going to continue to live my life the way it always has been. It doesn't acknowledge that a drastic change has happened, whether you wanted it to or not. So that can be outright psychotic. And I have had patients that have experienced things to that point. Uh, I've had patients who tell me that their next step is to go home and they're going to make dinner for their loved one, except their loved one has been dead for years. So, yeah, it, it can be that bad. But the good news about these stages is that for the most part, 
They don't have to happen in a certain order. And they really are things that we adjust to over time. It's just that we don't know how much time it's going to take. Denial can be pretty darn quick depending on how the person's framework is structured around them. Uh, in Banshee's case, she's got a lot of people that I don't want to say are throwing it in her face, but they they are making sure that whatever processes need to happen still happen. But I, I also think it's important to recognize in, in comics, in her case, it's not that she is totally wrong. It's that she, she's basically saying, I guess we're going to have to wait and see. <laughs> so, so she's playing out the first phase much more than the second phase, but everybody's reacting like she's dealing with the second phase instead of the first. So you end up with this dissonance that until he's back, you just kind of look at on one side, they're probably like, oh, she's not exactly all there. Well, meanwhile, she's saying, well, they're just really ignorant. <laughs> so it, it gets played up in, in literature a much different way than we would in real life. That's a fair point. And, and certainly I'm not saying that anyone's denial of legitimate permadeath in the real world is ever funny. It certainly it shouldn't be, be played for comedy. But in fiction, I do think that there is that trope of, oh, let's take this really macabre thing and make light of it. See, for example, this podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. So the next stage of grief then is anger. And I think there are copious examples of, of anger at death, permanent or not. But one that, that Matt has brought up in the live chat is Nightcrawler. When Jean Grey died the first time, he cursed out God. And Nightcrawler is very much a man of faith. And in fact, to bring it back to the, the ongoing X-Men books, Nightcrawler is the one examining whether mutants have lost their souls because of the way in which Krakoa and the mutant community has sort of reinvented themselves and the non-permanence of death and things of that nature. Nightcrawler being the, the devout Christian that he is, is sort of taking a very religious look at this. And so I do think that it is very in character for someone like Nightcrawler to be angry at God or whomever to lash out and say, why did you take this, this person from us? And again, we do see anger as a reaction in a number of comic stories. There are always those, even for characters that are in communities that you know have high potentials for resurrection there are still cases of characters confidants and loved ones getting very angry that uh that a character has died you know there were there were a couple of folks that were angry if i recall when wolverine died and when logan died several years ago there was some some consternation i think not not as much as with other characters because of the nature of of who Logan is slash was, but somebody like Gene, who at that point was still, it was understandable that people would get angry when she died is, is what I'm getting at. So I'll, I'll leave it to you to talk about anger. The idea is that external forces have changed the situation in a way that's more powerful than your actions could do. So basically, you end up with, even if it's not permanent, someone has ruined your day. They have destroyed a part of what you consider to be important. A living entity is now somehow, some way, no longer a part of your life. And on the minor levels, if we're not talking about death, Sometimes we could be talking about things like breakups. We could be talking about being fired. We could talk about about anything, really, that has to do with things being outside of your control. And it's even worse if you can if you can identify someone specific, then that entity, that society, that person, whatever, they can 
be your number one focus of all of that energy, all of that unusable fury that develops after the fact. That's the other part that's important to note. This can't happen ahead of time because otherwise we would call that frustration. We would call it disappointment. And and there is a difference there. If you could see coming that even in our world, that someone may or may not survive after having a very difficult illness or they get a terminal diagnosis, then the process can be a bit different than it just hitting you out of the blue. Those quote unquote tragedies, the unexpected losses, the the natural disasters, all of those things that happen where it doesn't matter what was on your mind before, this now takes the forefront. And in a strange way, it can lead to more focus because it starts to take up more of your mental bandwidth than anything else in your life. But on the other hand, it means also that you're not going to refill the tank with your emotional energy. You're, you're now in pure expending mode. You're, you're just making sure that anything you could do to, quote unquote, get it out, that's what you're doing. And that can be incredibly toxic. It doesn't have to be, but it can be. So to bring it back to the comics situation, this is something that I, I always wonder about because when things like this happen and the person comes back, do they truly appreciate just how disruptive their death was in terms of who was fighting for them or who wanted to get revenge or all that other stuff? Because we've had characters come back with anger for obvious reasons. Jason Todd, of course, comes to mind with that. But even his reanimation, it, it, it's fascinating because the characters that you figured would be the most angry about it are more perplexed than anything and can't match his anger, <laughs> at least the way I read it. <laughs> so I, I always wonder about that. And, and, and to bring it back to our world, I know I'm going back and forth, but that's pretty much what we do because actually that's what this topic does. I always think it's interesting for a therapist, if we're having a greater emotional response to a negative res a negative situation than our patient, then that may give us a clue as to what that person's emotional level is. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's going to skew towards you're, you're not on the right track because the patient's emotion should lead where we're going, not the other way around. And, and death, grief, all of it, that can be a huge launching point for those types of discussions. Uh, and if it were in a comic, it could be cheapened a little bit because, once again, someone could have the backstop of, in theory, a therapist saying, like, well, you know, there's always that outside chance. And it's like, I don't want to give you false hope, but hey, there's something there, you know, but we'll see. That's a very good point. The part about taking your cues from the patient, something that uh, I suppose I, I hadn't considered, but when you say it out loud, uh, obviously makes uh, great logical sense that the that if you're having the the response and they're not, you have to find out why, you know. And I know this is this goes beyond just even anger. This is if someone's telling you a story. You know, and I, I'm sure we've all had this experience where someone's telling you a story and you're getting really upset about this, whether, you know, you could be really sad or you could be just really more likely you're very, very pissed off about it. And like, why are you getting angry? I'm angry for you. You know, how, we've all said that at some point in our lives. I'm angry for you. But you have to think about why is it that it's triggering that response in you versus the other person? A fascinating idea. Also, I... I wish I had like more comics committed to memory and I've read, you know, thousands of comics uh, in my lifetime, but I don't have stories that I could just, you know, snap my fingers and recall off the top of my head. But the notion that when a character does come back, that they inquire, did you miss me? Did you mourn me? Et cetera. You know, the closest 
the, like the the scene that comes to my mind is when in the Avengers movie where Thor sees Loki and he's like, we thought you dead. And Loki says, did you mourn me? And Thor's just like, of course, we all did. It's that idea of, did did you care? Who cared about me? Like, you know, almost being able to say, who showed up to my funeral? I, I'm sure that we've all, again, a large percentage of us have given consideration to that idea of, oh, if I die tomorrow, who's who's going to come? Who's going to be interested? Oh, this person didn't show up to my funeral? Well, da 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 You know, that that sort of, of mindset. It's not healthy. I'll just, I'll say that much. Don't get into the, the headspace of who would show up to my funeral and then start trying to parse that out and then well, know, don't, th- don't do that. Well, that's what makes this particular topic so perverse because now you're not talking about the hypothesis. You're talking about the receipt. Yes. Yes. Very true. So the next stage of grief is bargaining. And the best example I can think of for bargaining over death or an, an, a pending death is Spider-Man for Aunt May in the infamous One More Day storyline where Spider-Man, where Aunt May is dying and Spider-Man says, makes it literal deal with Mephisto to save Aunt May and Mephisto wants his marriage. Why? Because comics buy the t-shirt. But it's now I'm just thinking about the one more day story and I'm just getting really mad. So I'll just stop and let you talk well, about it because if I talk about one more day, I'm going to let expletives fly. Well, I'm going to add in something else. And I know we're going out of order, but because Matt wrote all of this, I want to make sure we include as much of it as we can. And this is Exhibit F, uh, where he gives in The Incredible Hercules. So Hercules takes Amadeus Cho to Erebus, the region of the Greek underworld that is adjacent to the mortal realm. It's presented to Amadeus as a casino, where we see a litany of dead comic book characters who don't feel like being all the way dead, yet whiling away their time gambling for the right to be the next one to come back to life. So when you combine those two examples, we get the idea that this is transactional. And therefore, unlike our world where, for the most part, we consider this a one-way transaction, maybe there is another path. And why am I saying for the most part in our world? Because we have given credence to the afterlife. We have given credence to the idea of reincarnation or of altered souls, of things that are beyond what we have knowingly experienced. And I'm not saying that's wrong. As a matter of fact, I think that can be a wonderful thing. But it still points out to this idea that there is something more that we don't understand. And if that's the case, we'd better be prepared for that as well. And so the idea of bargaining when it comes to grief is that there may be another way. And Mephisto's deal, which is terrible, and Matt's example just point out that If something is transactional, then that means that we have to negotiate the price. And that means that in theory, there is something within our control to reverse the situation. And if we are able to do just enough to regain that control, then all of this can be done away with. It's it's the literal undoing. So from that standpoint, how healthy or unhealthy is that? Once again, these are different phases. Don't have to even happen this way. You don't even have to have all of the phases if you're going through grief. But in this case, if you're saying that you want to make sure that someone you love gets last rights, that doesn't sound so ridiculous, does it? If you want to make sure that you have made peace with people that you have fallen out with, Does that really sound like a problem? And yet the reason why many people do this is because they they want their soul to be at rest. And the reason for that is because, very traditionally, that means you, if you don't handle these things while you're alive, then the consequences of that 
are going to meet you in the afterlife in some way, shape or form. You're going to be held accountable for all the things that you've done or haven't done. So this isn't as absurd as it sounds when you put it in that framework. What becomes absurd is the idea that it's transactional in the way that we look at accounts, that we look at monetary things, physical things. Then then it starts getting into the realm of of what we realize is not nearly as important. And I don't want to necessarily make this a separate call to action or anything, but you don't need to be the richest man in the graveyard. You don't have to recognize that nobody's going to allow you to take your cars, your houses, your all your other things with you when you're buried or whatever. So how much stock do you need to put in that? There, there's, there's a significant consideration for that. But how much stock do you have to put in the relationships that you still have? Because those are the things, the memories, the legacy, all of that stuff that we've discussed ad infinitum in other episodes. Those are the things that seem to be much more lasting than any of the other typical transactional stuff. Does that make it better? I, I don't know. In my way, I say, thankfully, I, I haven't had to experience these things at that level just yet. Ironically, I have no idea if Anthony's had to deal with some of this, only you know, being an estate attorney, uh, how people handle these things on the practical level. But my goodness, I, I, I think when we talk about bargaining, it's just, once again, that human nature to say we are trying to control the uncontrollable by putting certain limitations and boundaries on our own mindsets so that we don't completely lose our sense of self when those around us eventually pass away. Hmm. Well, I don't do a whole lot of estate planning. Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I do it, but it's not my main gig. So I can't ever say that I've encountered that type of a situation. But if I ever do, I'll be sure to remember this episode. So the fourth stage of grief is depression. And I don't think you have to look very hard to find examples of depression and death in comics after a character is, is dead, their loved ones, their teammates, et cetera. It, it impacts them and it makes them very sad. So, I mean, I don't know how much we want to discuss this because I think it's fairly straightforward unless you have an interesting take on it. Well, I'll just add this one little bit because the idea of depression, meaning sadness, is something that everyone can relate to. And most people relate to mourning when it comes to crying and, and feeling bad, et cetera, et cetera. But the variation I want to point out is sometimes depression is anger turned inward. And I know I've said that before. And the reason I want to bring that up is because there may be people involved when we mentioned anger about the external factors being the cause of the death. But what if it was something that you think, for whatever reason, you could control? You wonder to yourself, did I do enough? Is it my fault? Was I missing something? And what I'm talking about with this, to be honest with you, is the idea of suicide. If someone that you know has taken their life, they are, they are gone. And I know that some people when react in the way of saying, and by the way, what I'm about to say is something that I've admit I've thought myself and, and that doesn't make me a horrible person because I know I can go into that sp spiral of shame. The idea of, oh, wow, what a selfish act or, oh, if they were only stronger or all these other knee jerk reaction things that sometimes we think to ourselves just to comfort us with the idea of, well, it wasn't in my realm of responsibility. It's their fault. And, and, and yet. At some point, most of us come to the realization that, well, no, it's not a matter of fault. It's just a matter of what do we learn and, and, and what do we do to help next time so that this happens less often. And things like that, if we don't acknowledge it, I think end up getting pushed down or pushed back to the point that we're waiting for something to happen rather than incorporating people into our lives to the point that they don't feel like they're completely alone. So once again, that's something that could be mentioned. But comics, for the most part, when people die, if it's not being played up as, well, we know they'll come back at some point, it is treated pretty on par with what you would expect. They have funerals. They have 
honoring services. They they do all of these things that indicate that it's a sad time. And the idea that it's not permanent or may not be permanent doesn't eliminate sadness. If someone you know, let's say, gets a diagnosis of something that's going to leave them potentially incapacitated for a while, even if they were to make a full recovery, that still doesn't eliminate the sadness that has happened at all. So it doesn't have to take away from that. I understand the idea that oh, well, you can't get too sad because at some point they'll come back. But no, it's more like I know that this sadness is a part of what I'm experiencing because it's real. And whatever happens after this point, whether it be more sadness or a sense of fulfillment or a sense of joy or a sense of celebration of this person's life, if they do happen to pass and it's not something that's going to be reversible, then I'm willing to say that I can honor that person's memory the way that they would want me to if they were still here. There are so many variations on this stuff. So I don't want to just let the idea that comics cheapens death mean that comics cheapens emotion. I think it's the opposite. Ooh, I think that's going to be our Friday Instagram quote for this episode. I like that. So the last stage then is acceptance. And I think we, we see this stage frequently in comics as well although i i do like how it's played with sometimes where and i'll i'll use exhibit d here uh of maths as an example astonishing x-men the cure when kitty pride finds colossus alive and well she is lucid enough to quickly run through the gamut of all the possible explanations you have to know if you're a clone or a robot or an alternate universe thingy i can deal but if you're some shapeshifter or psionicist watching me twitch i will kill you with an axe Finding someone you thought was dead is alive is so common that there's a checklist to go through. So she has accepted Peter's dead. And so this presentation that he's, in fact, not actually dead, I don't want to say nonchalant about it, but she has to go through that logical process first. And I I do like how that's sort of played with. This is Joss Whedon, so it's typical like, oh, here's a serious thing and I'm going to be really quippy about it. But it does sort of give credence to that idea of that there is there's a general acceptance, but there's acceptance of death, but there's also an acceptance that it's not always necessarily the end. And I think that's again unique to to comics, at least in terms of the frequency with which it's utilized. So what I'm about to say may be one of the most dry analogies that I have ever used. And it's about, I am here for it. it Bring it a, on. It, it's about insurance. So there are some very important insurances that we need in our lives. Literally, in our lives. Life insurance is important if you have anybody that you care about is going to need your support even after you die prematurely. And so make sure you have that if you have anyone that you're providing for right now. Disability insurance is really important if you're not able to continue to provide for those same people in one way or another for the amount of time that you end up disabled. Health insurance is really important if at any point You think that you may not be 100% healthy and you're going to get illnesses at any point in your life. The reason why I'm bringing these things up is because on a typical basic human level, we ignore all of this and are horrible at it. Who thinks on a regular basis, okay, the next time I walk out of my door, I'm about to get struck by lightning. Not going to happen. Highly unlikely. But you get in your car. And what are the odds that you have a car accident? Well, if you actually look statistically, (laughs) there's a chance that you're going to get into a car accident sooner rather than later. Is it going to leave you permanently scarred? Highly unlikely. Is it going to be enough that you end up with some sort of injury at some point? (laughs) Once again, maybe. And yet we know that sometimes people have actions that are out of your control. If a drunk driver T-bones you and now your car flips and you end up with something that may not kill you, but ends up 
leading to a long hospitalization. So you're no longer working. And in addition to that, you have those huge hospital bills that because you didn't have insurance, you now have a triple whammy. You have no transportation when you do get healthy. You probably don't have your job, even if it is protected, only because you can't do what you used to do. And your unemployment doesn't match up with what you were used to paying for all the people that provided for you. All of these things are there without us ever considering those consequences until they happen. And then magically, the thing that I most commonly hear is, oh, wow, if only I had known. The truth is you have history. You have all of human experience to let us know that there are certain things that are going to happen. You are going to be older moments from now than what you are now. You are going to not be as well at some point than as you are now. You are going to die. Even if it, quote unquote, weren't permanent, it's still a state that people are going to have to adjust to for however long it is. So the idea that we basically put all this in a black box, ignore it for most of our lives, and then wait until something negative happens and then say, oh, what, what do we do? What do we do? It's too late. I'm actually using this as an opportunity to point out to people that our planning skills have already been monetized to a point that people have put numbers to them. People complain to me once in a while about their disability insurance and why it's so expensive. Why? Because it's more common. It's way more common that you're going to end up with something that leaves you worse off for a short period of time than you are to die really young. That's the truth of it. Actuarial tables. That's exactly what they are. I wasn't going to use the actual term for it because I didn't want to get that technical with it. But yes, that is what they are for. We know this stuff. So if it sounds like I'm on a soapbox in a way I am, because I don't want people to have this. I don't want children suffering because dad thought, ah, well, what's the risk? Forget insurance. The idea of wearing a seatbelt, the idea of certain things that we know are potentially life saving, <coughs> wear a mask, that we have learned to just say, well, what's the harm? Like, why, why does that make a difference? And the answer is we've had this information for centuries. We know this. Please stop ignoring reality, people. I, I, I'm begging you. So when we talk about acceptance, it's not just the, the psychological idea that we realize that things are going to adapt and change whether we want to or not. It's the idea that we can take action now that will allow that transition to happen incredibly smoother than what we would be able to do if we just wait and see what happens. Well, it's funny that you you went off on that tirade. Uh, there's, <laughs> for lack of a better term, because Matt, in his submission, said, I feel like the ability of human beings to take stock of proper risk assessment of things that are dangerous and or potentially lethal, compounded with the things that could harm or kill them but are so remotely unlikely as to not even really exist. That's a pretty big, timely topic right now. So yeah, he, he put the ball on the tee and you hit, you know, a 350 yard drive. You okay. went happy Gilmore on that. So, so I'm going to make a recommendation and nobody has to do this if this is way too nerdy, which I know sounds like, how can that be possible? There are two books, The Black Swan and Anti-Fragile. They are not psychology books. They are not health care books. They are actually economics books. Okay. They're written by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who's a very famous economist a fa and, and in the finance world is kind of a, I don't want to say controversial, but, but he is such a Debbie Downer about a lot of things. But that doesn't make his points any less salient. And, and his main points are, we can think that things are never going to happen as bad as they could. But that doesn't mean you can't prepare like the worst can happen. And the question is, how much do you put into that? Do you have to doomsday prep for the next five years on the idea that everything is going to collapse tomorrow? No. But that doesn't mean that you probably should go YOLO and completely ignore everything for the rest of your life either. There can be some middle ground there. And I would say that middle ground reaches two standard deviations. If you're in that 95% range one way or another, 
you're probably going to be okay. Just avoid those extremes, please. I appreciate the use of standard deviations to describe it. We're within two sigma here. We don't need to go full five sigma. (laughs) Some statistics uh, for you folks. And I think we've lost 97% of our audience. So another thing that I want to talk about with respect to death is the notion of dealing with deaths of heroes versus deaths of villains. When a hero dies, there's sadness, there's hope that they can somehow come back, but there's, you know, that overall sense of grief. When a villain dies, especially in comics, there is often a sense of, I don't think that's actually the last we're going to see of them. Heroes, we, we hope, we'll see them again. Villains can die, but we know they'll come back. And that's in-universe. And I think that's a very interesting mindset to have that even amongst all of these superpowered individuals, the understanding that the bad guys will always somehow find a way to come back. The heroes may or may not, but the villains will always return. And I think that's telling from a psychological standpoint and also a storytelling standpoint. Well, I also think that has to do with the idea that by definition, villainy is something that is done in secret. What do I mean by that? No person that I'm aware of says to themselves, okay, I want to make as many people in the world as miserable as possible in the shortest period of time I can. And if you do say that, then be honest, uh, I would say get some immediate help, like really. But when you write stories the way they have to be written for comics, yes, you will get a background that makes them more relatable, but it makes it clear that these are characters that one way or another have to be stopped. And yes, Lethal Force is going to be included if necessary for the most part with rare exceptions. But then there's that very practical point to get back to writing as a whole. You know the show must go on. You know the story has to continue. And so unless you really think that you have an unlimited well, imagine if this were one writer having to write a comic for the rest of his life and and someone said that's what you had to do. That's a really tough job to say, Okay, I'm going to create such a perfect analog of the real world because we have billions of people in our world that I'll just make sure I have a slight variation of every real person, create an analog, and I'll be able to go indefinitely. No one's mind works that way. It really doesn't. People think that they can do it, but you can't. And so it's not cheating. I wouldn't say that it, it's, it's a cheating shortcut, but it's a way to process what otherwise would be way too difficult a task. You have to have a certain character there to work with the other characters you've already created. And if you notice that that dynamic is something that you enjoy, you like telling those variations on those characters for particular stories, then you're going to find every way you can to shoehorn it in. Because let's be honest, what's the other angle that has happened? And I'm going to use Batman as an example. Why was the Joker written besides the code? I know it's the code, but why was the Joker written in such a way that he constantly would get away with doing the things he was doing. It wasn't just the idea that you didn't want too much violence. It's because there comes a certain limit that got translated into the movies at some point where you know if someone's doing this, they're getting taken down. They're done. They are probably getting killed on sight. So we're not going to have this happen over and over again. It's just the idea that evil be it people doing bad things or people having tenets that are going to lead to other people suffering, that's always going to go on. And comics are just a microcosm of that. So it doesn't really matter whether or not we say, oh, they're going to come back or whatever. I think the statement there is, well, we know that other people, other characters or, or someone or something is always going to try and we always have to be on alert. As opposed to the idea that the amount of effort it takes to fight that villainy the idea that you need people to do what we consider to be extraordinary things to fight things that otherwise we may not be able to fight alone, that that's a finite resource. 
yes, there will always be people and characters willing to step up, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be able to go to that well as quickly as people are trying to fight against them. And that is an underlying fear. I'll tell you what, I'll give an example from my childhood that is not real world, but it is real life. And what I mean by that is in wrestling, the first time I actually saw Hulk Hogan lose, my world was shook because my point was, oh, my God, this guy is like amazing. He could do anything. And for him to lose, like, wait, that means that there's nobody left. Like everybody's lost. Oh, no. Obviously, I'm exaggerating, but still. The idea that the people that you hold to the highest standard, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they lose a fight. It could be that they're not doing what you thought was the appropriate thing. Their fall from grace. That counts too. Not to mention mourning if it's true that someone has died and heaven forbid it's premature or heaven forbid it's in battle. We know that that's not an infinite well. We know that there's a limit. And one of the greatest fears of humanity is that at some point we're going to have no one left to fight. I think as long as we are humans, there's always going to be someone to fight. I, I think that's sad. It's an unfortunate way to view things. But I do honestly think that I don't know that we're ever going to reach the point of nirvana, peace, what have you that we will all collectively, mankind, unite under the single banner of mankind. Maybe, maybe if there's like, if we learn there's a hostile alien force, maybe we'll all come together and be like, yeah, I may not like you because of your voting politics, but at least I know that you're human. Which once again leads to the idea, you're, what you're talking about is Star Trek now. So... The idea that the human collective is in full unison and that's been solved. But now there are other species that are also sentient that may or may not agree. And the idea of the ever escalating war that no matter what level you go at, be it species to species within cultures of the same species uh, amongst other things that we don't even know about, all of that, the idea that there's always going to be conflict, that's important. But then the idea that the conflict resolution leads to ultimate destruction, that's something scary. And I'm not trying to be fear mongering, but I'm saying that that's how civilizations have ended. It's not just because they're there for a very long time. It's because enough people disagreed with how things were going. and. So death, not just of a single person, but death of a people, extinction, those are things that no one really likes to think about. And yet the second that it gets brought up, that's when people are considered at times trying to exaggerate for, for effect. But in comics, you're allowed to dream that way. You're allowed to bring these things up. And once again, if you have someone or some group or whatever, be it X-Men, be it Justice League, be it Avengers, whatever, the idea that you have a collective that's going to be stronger than one individual dying. And, and it is mentioned, for example, to go back to Matt's things, Martian Manhunter, he gets mourned, but at the same time, in their world, it's we pray for him somehow being resurrected. And I, I remember specifically with Final Crisis, which also it's interesting Matt mentioned that, but it was also the recreation of Darkseid who hadn't been around and using a regular human being for that. That led to a lot of people being creeped out because once again, it was, oh, my God, we people are finding a way to bring back one of the ultimate evils in a way that we didn't anticipate. And the ones that are bringing them back are doing it by taking one of our strongest fighters and eliminating them. So that microcosm is exactly what I'm talking about. That one example just summarized way quicker than what you and I just said. Why didn't you lead with that then? 
I would <laughs> if I were able to have a more coherent format and style, but that wouldn't be this podcast, would it? Yeah, fair point. So the last thing I want to talk about then as far as, as issues is dealing with deaths of superpowered individuals versus deaths of non-powered individuals. And it's just interesting to see how, again, they're handled very differently. The death of somebody, death of any of the Avengers versus the death of Aunt May. You see in how you saw how Spider-Man reacted to the idea that, that Aunt May was going to die. Never mind the fact that she was an old woman. I understand. Listen, I'm not telling anybody not to grieve for your elderly relatives, but she, she was an older woman, especially this is 616 Aunt May. So she's like the old, old Aunt May, not the young Marissa Tomei, a hot Aunt May. The old Aunt May, she gets hit with a bullet. It's a, it's a magical bullet. And no, no, Dr. Strange can't fix it. I don't want to say like, let her die because that's that's very callous of me. But my point is, you're you're going to all this this length because you know that she's not going to be in that pool of potential resurrections. I, I don't want to say just let her go, but I just find it very interesting that Spider-Man didn't go balls out for anybody else, any of his teammates, any of his friends, the way that he did for Aunt May. And I know a lot of that is family, obviously. And, and I'm sure everybody listening is going, well, duh, Anthony. But again, I think it's just the, the notion of non-powered versus powered individuals, the deaths are treated, even lovers, significant others, et cetera, people that are not in the game, their deaths are given the, the meaning and the depth and the gravity that I think some of the powered individuals should have. But I think it's because we know that somebody like Rene Montoya or somebody like the, the, the cop, Spider-Man's uh, Gene DeWolf, they're not coming back. But, mm. you know, a hero, even a villain, could. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I probably should have gone with Gene DeWolf as opposed to Aunt May. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I'm like... But, but Gene DeWolf man, didn't oh man, come to me Man, when you're putting it out there like that, I'm like, oh, jeez. Uh, okay. Gene, this, much like, hey, listen, you know, like, what did you just say? If we had structure, it wouldn't be this show. So... <laughs> Touche. So I'm not sure I have a, a a decent analog to this because the comics themselves have made it clear that we're going to talk about the the people that are important. And I, I, I apologize. I don't mean that flippantly. I'm saying that's the whole point of storytelling. You're only going to focus on so many at any given time. No one comic is going to do every major character, even if they happen to be mentioned in passing. And once again, if we're saying that this is an analog of our real world or any of the comic universes are analogs of our universe, then there's no way that they're going to try and get to the grandeur level of every individual person as a character. So I give them a lot of carte blanche with that. I, I don't really... I don't necessarily disagree with your point. I just find it fascinating in terms of what ends up being permanent. It, it may be inversely correlated with what we see in our own lives. Oh, man, I'm really hesitating to do this, but I am. And I know it's going to date this episode. But what do we think when someone we know personally dies? We usually go through any variation of the stages we mentioned. We have all of the emotional responses attached to that. It may be an indefinite amount of time. Hopefully, if it's negative, it starts to fade fairly quickly, while the positivity of remembrance and enjoyment of experiences carry us through for the rest of our lives. And, and I know I'm trying to say this in such a nice, flowery way because I know it's more difficult than that, and I understand that. Having said all of that, that's for people you know personally, and there is no right or wrong way to f feel about that or to grieve about someone's death. And yet, the second that I say something like, I hope the royal family is dealing with their loss in a, an appropriate way as the world mourns, or 
I say R.I.P. DMX, all of a sudden, we see vigils. We see large outpourings. We see humongous responses from people who have never met these individuals. And yet, for one reason or another, obviously because of their public exposure, do feel a connection greater than what would be anticipated unless they had direct interactions. And I think over time that's been magnified. And I'm not, I'm not talking about positives or negatives of social media. I just think exposure in general. But even then, that's not exactly accurate because, no offense, I'm not aware of anybody in my personal family having statues of our ancestors, unless I want to try and dig deep enough to find someone like that. But I know fully well when I go to Washington, D.C., I know what the monuments are. I know that certain people throughout our civilizations have had effigies, have had large tributes. So it's not a modern thing. That's, that's a human thing. You can tell who was considered important at the time by what they did after they died. So that's not really different than how you would expect comics to deal with it. It's just different in the sense that you can now put the scale in the opposite way. While we're saying we need to do everything we can to remember all of the greats well after they're gone, otherwise no one else is going to do it for us. In comics, it's more like we need to make sure we remember the ones that are unlikely to come back because no one else is going to put in the energy. Very interesting. I did not know where you were going to go with that. But I think it's, it's telling. Interesting. Hmm. Now I'm thinking about the people who died, who didn't get the vigils. And it happens obviously every day that the overwhelming majority of them don't get statues, even though we personally would love to build a statue in their honor. I'm, I'm going to start putting aside money now so that by the time that I die, Y'all have money for a statue of me. <laughs> me personally, I'd much rather. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to go Hunter S. Thompson on this. <laughs> and you could look that up if you don't know what the heck he had done for him. Oh, my God. But at the same time, I am the complete opposite. And this is one of those rare times where I, I will say in general, I think Anthony and I are on opposite ends. And I don't mean this in a negative way. I, I really don't. It's just a personality thing. So I know, as Anthony said, I, I think he would like a nice statue. I think he would love a great service. I think he would want all these things. And I'm not talking about getting into the super heady stuff. My point is I'm on the complete opposite end of the spectrum because my thing is I'd much rather be a gossamer. I'd much rather be this ephemeral thought in the wind of the idea that at some point some random guy did something nice and help somebody at some point somewhere. And even if it's as vague as that and nobody remembers after the next few seconds, as soon as I pass on, that's totally fine with me. That's okay. There, you know, there are millions and billions before me. There'll be millions and billions, hopefully after me. And I am just a tiny, tiny nano microsecond of a fracture of a fragment in all of it. And doggone it, I'm glad I was able to exist. That's it. Fair enough. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, we will discuss treatment, such as it is. Stay tuned. If you're into all things comics, you have to check out Take a Knee for Marvel vs. DC, your go-to podcast for comic and superhero discussion, debates, polls, and more. Tune in as regular Scott and Ozzy Killmonger chat about your favorite comic topics, and you never know who may show up for an open mic or what will be next on their favorite one gotta go. Take a knee for Marvel vs. DC. Every Sunday, powered by the Defy Light Podcast Network. Good morning. Brian Wayne here to tell you about my new podcast, The Real Brains. The Real Brains podcast is a show coming out daily, dedicated to the everyday struggle of just the average human being. From troubles with rage to uh, just anecdotes about uh, very strange human interactions. 
This podcast really is just a uh, somebody that's all too familiar with the struggle. I'm here to let you know that you are not alone. So come laugh at uh, our pain together every single weekday, every place you can catch a podcast. Check out The Real Brains with Brian Wayne. Remember, stay sane. Hi, I'm Jeremy Whitley, and you're listening to Capes on the Couch. We're back. So treatment, as we are wont to do with our thematic episodes, treatment is less specific and more just generalized. But I think that the treatment has to be for, obviously, the survivors and the loved ones of the deceased in addressing how they are handling this person's passing, whether it was timely, untimely. Let's focus on, you know, superhero teammates, et cetera. But what what would you say to them? Yeah. So I, I'm understanding you're not a grief counselor, of course. Right. Well, well, I mean, if you have, another experience with another human being about loss, then you're a grief counselor, whether you realize it or not. But to get to the point with superheroes, especially in that type of world, I've been thinking about this off and on since the Capes in Court episode. And I think what would be necessary is a a, a grief policy statement, almost like a not exactly a will or or advanced directive or, or things like that, but just the idea that if someone you love is at some point considered dead, then put some guardrails to it. How long do you want to, if you have the predilection to, for example, search, how long do you wish to search for your sense of finality? If you ascribe to the idea that they may or may not come back, then what are your expectations? Meaning, who do you want to contact to verify that this person is who they say they are? Knowing yourself, along with your counselor, how often would you like to check in about your emotions? Write down your stage, quote unquote, because you may cycle through more than one time. based on your own experience. Write down the people that have been in similar circumstances that have come back. And if so, what were your responses then? Because it's a great chance that you're going to react the same way again. In other words, do a lot of strategic psychological planning around something that we know based on the comic history is not always going to go the way that you planned. It, it, it really is the unknown and, and almost treating it as if, yes, it may be permanent, but may not be. It is a very serious event that needs to be accounted for and may end up being reversed at some point, in which case you still have to go through a similar emotional process. If the more you can prepare ahead of time, You're always hoping for the best, preparing for the worst, and once again, putting some times to it. Because if you don't, this ephemeral idea of, well, someday, and then you're on your deathbed 90 years from now saying, well, I guess it never happened. And and nobody wants to be in that moment, both in universe and out of universe, on their deathbed saying, well, I wonder if. I would push back on on just the last little bit of that with respect to the hope for the best plan for the worst because I discussed this with my therapist, this idea that I am forever hoping for the best planning for the worst and always planning, planning, planning and needing to do the next, you know, three to 17 steps ahead of whatever's happening right now. I see what you're saying. I I got so anxious and focused on worst case scenarios that may never happen that I was ignoring or downplaying what was happening right in front of me. And I spent far too much time preparing for conversations that didn't happen 
because I would say, I'm going to say this, and then they're going to say this. And then if they say this, uh, how am I going to respond? Well, if I say this, then they'll respond. Like playing out, it was like a choose your own adventure, all happening in my head all the time. And once again, we go to those standard deviations. I'm not advocating that someone do that. Oh, I know you're not. At I'm that just saying level. Like, but, I under, but I do understand that. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely correct. There is a risk with that. And and that's why I, I call it guardrails. Like the idea that you are supposed to have some guidance with this. It's not meant to be just total free willing about it. That's that's fair. But like I said, it it was and continues to be the source of anxiety for me. And so I'm working on trying to let go of those fears of that always saying, well, what if, what if, what if, and just saying, let's just focus on what is, and I'll deal with whatever when the time comes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What you just said, that is it. And, and I actually could think of a patient right now that I've dealt with where I've said to that patient, okay, we went over this. And they'll come to me like maybe an hour later and they'll just say, yeah, but what about? And I, I said, we went over it. You don't have to do it again. It's, it's OK. There's nothing wrong. And, and sometimes patients will even come up with unknowns that I hadn't thought about. And my point is, that's OK. It's planning. It's not a plan. And so there's always going to be adaptations. But don't do that every day. Just that, that's not. Yeah, that's not productive. That's. You know, that that rumination, yeah, just leads to its own anxiety that feeds on itself. And yeah, there has to be a limit to that. You know, that's why I'm saying, like, don't be a YOLOer automatically with everything, but also don't end up, you know, just totally so, so bogged down in in like, once again, that I love that term, the black swans that may or may not come. Once you've done your original plan for them, it's like, hey. Chips fall where they may. You, you, you got it. You know, let's move on to, to enjoying everything else in between. Well said. And I'm, I'm still, as I said, working on trying to come to that middle, middle ground. Middle ground and I have never really been well acquainted. I'm, I tend to the extremes like Billy Joel. So uh, that's, that's generally where I go. Uh, with my my daily existence. So I, we covered a lot here. This episode has gone on much longer than I initially anticipated. But I think one of the the key takeaways here is that everything we've we've talked about is fiction in the sense that death is certainly, you know, permanent in our reality. But the feelings that these characters go through whatever the stage of grief they may or may not be in, however they're perceiving things, these can all be very legitimate and very real. And so what I would say to anybody who is struggling with a a recent death or even, as you said, a potentially pending death, you know, I think it was when we were talking about bargaining, whatever, when you have somebody that you know is is in hospice, that they have limited time left. Talk to somebody about this. Address your feelings. Because bottling them up inside is not going to help anyone. And Doc, you made an excellent statement that if you've shared your story with someone, that makes you a grief counselor. Maybe not in the, the clinical sense, maybe not by formal title, but each of us share stories with other people. That's the human condition. And as long as we can continue to share those kinds of stories, share those feelings, judgment-free, and that is a big key, judgment-free, with love and acceptance, regardless of what the, the, the person going through the, the hard time is feeling, they can help get through it and you will help make their life easier. And maybe, just maybe, they'll mentally build a statue of you in their own mind. And that's how you do it. You may not get the physical statue, but if you can live your life in a way that you can touch 
the life of another person that they build a mental or emotional statue of you. You know, it's that comes back to that expression. People may not remember what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. That's the key takeaway from this. So be be kind to one another, whether whether the death is permanent or not. Just it's Will Wheaton's law. Don't be a dick. <laughs> well, this was this was maybe a little cornier and sappier than some of our recent episodes, but it definitely wasn't nearly <laughs> as emotional. No, no. Um, Which I thankfully for that, because I I yeah. didn't have the stomach for <laughs> uh, for anything more no. emotional. No, no. Uh, you know, I I'm going to end on on this note, and some people may have seen this coming, but even if you didn't, you'll recognize what I'm about to say. Let me tell you what I wish I'd known. When I was young and dreamed of glory, you have no control who lives, who dies, who tells your story, unless you write comics. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, there he is. There it is. Okay. So no recommended reading for this week in the sense that stories about Death and comics are all over the place. So upcoming episodes, we're we're talking to our friend Erica Schultz next week. That's going to be a good one. She's going to be talking about her up, upcoming book on Kickstarter and then Nebula and then Victor Zaz, which is going to be just delightful. <laughs> just, just uh, that's going to be a, a real hoot to talk about Mr. Zaz. So, uh, as always, you can find all of our episodes on our website, capesonthecouch.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Capes on the Couch. If you like what you hear, please leave us a rating and review on Podchaser or Apple Podcast or Stitcher, wherever you uh, can listen to us that has uh, the opportunity for reviews. Check out our Discord if you'd like to join our fan community, tinyurl.com slash Capes Discord, capital C, capital D. Uh, and join us uh, as we talk about all manner of comics, movies, TV shows, uh, mental health goals, what have you. It's it's a fun little community. And uh, you can also unlock additional material on our Patreon, patreon.com slash Capes in the Couch. You can get early access. You can unlock reviews, trade paperback reviews. You can unlock additional uncensored material. So it's a, it's a fun way to support the show. And uh, that's all I've got, Doc. You had your pun already, I assume. So you had your pun and your Hamilton reference. So, so you're good. And you made Ariel happy with the Hamilton reference. She loves when you sing. So for Doc Issues, I'm Anthony Sitko. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there.